Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Microbiology. In this session, we are going to discuss immunity. So we're going to discuss there are really two integrated aspects of your immunity. And if you've had A and P tune, then you're probably very familiar with them. But we have our innate immunity, which is our nonspecific defenses, and then we have specific defenses. So. This chapter is only going to focus on innate immunity or the immunity that you're born with. In chapter 17, then we'll talk about specific defenses or what we can also call adaptive immunity. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive on in. So here are just some of the, the learning objectives. And as I said before, um, um, I won't be going over them during our session, but please use these to guide your studying. All right, so a little bit of vocab to get this party started. So susceptibility, when we talk about a person being susceptible, that means that they have lack of resistance to a disease. So the higher your susceptibility, the lower your immunity or your ability to ward off the disease. Innate immunity, as I said before in our little introductory slide, is that that's going to be the immunity that you're born with, and that's going to have be any of your defenses against any pathogen whatsoever. It's not specific towards any particular type of pathogen. Pathogen. So it really doesn't have this aspect of memory that we would talk about for adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity is immunity or resistance to a very specific pathogen. So specificity is very important in adaptive immunity. In adaptive immunity, we're going to talk primarily about two camps of cells, B cells and T cells, and what they would later differentiate into. So this concept of immunity. On the, each of your cells, you have receptors, and those receptors or uh, tags let your body know that you are you. Um, you have these different kind of keys or entries to get into the cell. Host toll-like receptors attach to pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and these toll-like receptors can then um, induce cytokines. So basically what that's saying is that these receptors on your normal cells that are in your body, some of them can actually detect when there is a foreign entity that should not be there, a pathogen. And we know when we talk pathogens in microbiology, we're talking bacteria, viruses, or some sort of um, parasitic or um, protist uh, sort of structure. So. Um, with these toll-like receptors, they can attach to any of these molecular patterns or antigenic fragments, or an, an antigen is on the surface of another cell that says, hey, I'm a such and such, it's a tag, like says I'm this kind of cell. Um, these toll-like receptors can attach to some of these pathogen-associated molecular patterns or molecules or antigens, and they can tell the immune system to sound the alarm. So it can release these chemical messengers called cytokines that will regulate the intensity and the duration of the immune response. So it's kind of like these cells are detecting that there is something that should not quite be there. So when we talk about your adaptive immunity, keep in mind that we're, I'm sorry, not adaptive, we're talking about innate. When we're talking about your innate immunity, or your nonspecific immunity, the first line of defense, if you will, and it's kind of a misnomer because both adaptive and innate immunity work together, but um, if we work from the outside in, we have physical factors and we have chemical factors that will um, initiate an immune response. So the physical factors would include your skin, your mucous membrane. So your skin helps to keep these pathogens, these bacteria, outside of the box or from getting inside and becoming systemic. Your skin is consists of two parts of it. We have the epidermis, and we have the dermis, which lies underneath it. Your epidermis is consists of tightly packed cells that we call keratinocytes, and they're made out of what we call stratified squamous epithelial cells. Keratin is a special protective protein that keeps the skin um, so that it is water resistant but not waterproof, so that you'll notice when you take a shower, the water kind of beads and rolls off of you and doesn't completely absorb into your body like a sponge. So that's the job of keratin. And it helps by not allowing your body to absorb the water. Any pathogens that would be in the water are not going to immediately be absorbed into your skin. 
mucous membranes are another type of physical factor. Any opening in your body, and I'm going to let you all be creative with this, any opening in your body that has an exit to the outside world is going to be lined with a mucous membrane. So nostril passages, your throat, your mouth, mucous membrane. So what happens is that these mucous membranes have cells, goblet cells primarily, and they will release their secretions onto the surface of those cells, and they make this mucus, something very sticky and very viscous. So this very sticky, viscous substance helps to trap microorganisms and keep them from being inhaled or ingested. ingested. It doesn't get all of them, but it does a pretty good job of trapping any of these uh, microbes, considering that our body is constantly being bombarded and in inundated with um, microorganisms. We stay fairly healthy, given, you know, the odds that there are more microbes out there than there are of us. So um, these physical factors that we talked about so far, skin and mucus, they do a pretty good job. A ciliary escalator is in your trachea. So on your trachea, you have these cells that are called pseudostratified columnar, or pseudostratified ciliated epithelium cells, columnar epithelial cells. And the cilia beat in one direction. And the job of those cilia that are in your trachea is to transport those microbes up and away from that very sterile location of your lungs. So everyone take a second to clear your throat. <coughs> What did you do immediately following the clearing of your throat? You swallowed, right? So when you swallowed, when you cleared your throat, you were tickling those cilia in your trachea, and it was pushing those microbes up and away from your trachea and over past the epiglottis, so that when the epiglottis opens up, you then swallow them into your stomach, which is a very acidic environment and less hospitable for microorganisms. So they're very likely to be killed by the hydrochloric acid and the other enzymatic juices that are in your stomach. So here is a pretty picture of um, Bordetella pertussis, which is the agent that causes whooping, whooping cough that is trapped in the ciliated cells of the respiratory system. And some things that we can tell about Bordetella just from looking at it um, is that it is a rod-shaped organism. Other physical factors, um, you have a lacrimal apparatus that's in your eye that helps to wash your eye. When you get something in your eye, even if it's just a, um, an eyelash or something pokes your eye, it automatically will start to tear, um, and that's a draining mechanism to kind of wash and flush the eyes of any microorganism. Um, saliva helps to wash microorganisms off of um, the structures that are in your mouth, including your teeth and your jaws. Um, and once again, if you swallow any excess saliva, it's not going into the sterile environment of your lungs. It's going down into your stomach where it can be dealt with, let's see, hydrochloric acid and the um, various different enzymatic um, proteins that are in your stomach. Urine flows out of your body, and that is uh, through your urethra. And vaginal secretions also flow out of your body, and that's a way of keeping these organisms from overcolonizing. For women, women are more likely to have urinary tract infections than men are, simply because our urethra is much shorter. And even though urine does flow out, yes, but if there is an over-accumulation of microorganisms, then we will find that um, uh, women can develop a urinary tract infection, just as men can, but men are less likely to develop urinary tract infections because they have a longer urethra, so there's more surface area um, for the microbes to attach, so they don't accumulate in a small space as quickly as they will for females. So now on to chemical factors. So a little bit, I guess it's kind of on the... Uh, so chemical factors would be... Um, things that are chemicals that help to protect your body from any sort of pathogen. Um, we have fungostatic fatty acid in your sebum or in the oils of your skin. Um, the pH of your skin is fairly low, fairly acidic. And remember, most microorganisms like a pH of about 7. You know, 5 to 6 um, is probably as low as they really want to go. But they like a, a kind of, especially those that are pathogenic, like a pH of 7. So the fact that your skin has a low pH, it's going to inhibit the growth of many microorganisms. 
You have an enzyme called lysozyme that's in your sweat, your tears, your saliva, and your urine, and that also um, acts to um, keep the microbial loads down. What lysozyme does is it will actually break down um, the cell wall of microorganisms. Your gastric juices, if we talked about the hydrochloric acid and those other enzymatic act, um, enzymes or enzymatic proteins that are in your stomach have a very, very low pH, 1.2 to 3. So once again, that's very way too acidic for most microorganisms, especially those that are pathogenic. And then even your vaginal secretions are very low. So the pH of your vagina is fairly low, and most microorganisms don't like that pH. However, not all microorganisms like a pH of 7. Some, like Heliobacter pylori, actually like a pH that's very low. As a matter of fact, they like a pH of 1 or 2. So Heliobacter pylori can live in your gut. It actually prefers to live in your stomach because the pH is just right. Um, some of the bacteria that live in your vagina, if you are fortunate enough to have a vagina, um, considering those like um, Lactobacillus acidophilus, um, and you all are probably very familiar with that and that it's one of the cultures that is routinely found in yogurt, it likes that very low pH of the vagina, whereas other things really don't care for it as much. So there are some um, bacteria that live in your, your vagina and they're part of what we call your normal flora or your normal microbiota where they're the good guys. They're the bacteria that are there to help keep other bacteria from overcolonizing the area and causing an infection. And speaking of normal microbiota or normal flora is what I learned many moons ago, um, your normal flora are bacteria that are just normally on your body and what they do is they prevent pathogenic bacteria, those that would cause disease, from overcolonizing it. So those bacteria, they compete with the other bacteria for the little ecological niches of your body, such as in your vagina, in your skin, or in your stomach. So they compete with pathogens or alter the environment so that pathogens don't really have a hospitable place to colonize. What we say is that these bacteria of our normal microbiota are conventional microbiota, which means that one organism, the microbe benefits, and then the other organism, we, the host, is pretty much unharmed. Now, some of these normal microbiota, depending on where they are, they can be opportunistic pathogens. So we already know what a pathogen is, and that term opportunistic just means that if the situation reveals itself, then bacteria can take the opportunity to cause an infection. Great example of an opportunistic pathogen is E. coli. E. coli is supposed to hang out in your colon. We like E. coli to hang out in your colon. It helps with red blood cell recycling. It helps with vitamin K synthesis. It helps with biotin synthesis. All things we really need. But we need E. coli to stay in your large intestine. If at any point E. coli gets out of your large intestine and say, oh, somehow makes its way to your urinary tract, it can cause a urinary tract infection and will take that opportunity of being in an area where it's usually not supposed to be and it can overgrowth and overcolonize. Or if you have a situation where you're taking a broad spectrum um, antibiotic, then it can wipe away all of your good bacteria and it allows for some of those good bacteria to act in an opportunistic fashion if your immune system is compromised. So now on to other chemical, um, I guess these would be kind of considered chemical elements of um, micro uh, of innate immunity. We have these various different types of white blood cells. We have five classes of white blood cells. Three are what we consider granulocytes because they have little granules in them, and then two of them are considered to be agranulocytes. The granulocytes consist of neutrophils. We notice a neutrophil because it has a trilobed nucleus. Basophils. Basophils kind of look like smushed grapes on the inside of it. The nucleus is not as descriptive as what we'd see for the neutrophils. And anyone who's had AMP2, you probably are very familiar with all of these um, white blood cells. And then we have our and another granulocyte that we have is an eosinophil, which isn't on this slide, but we'll look at that in a second. The A granulocytes are our monocytes, and monocytes have a very characteristic um, U 
or bubble-shaped nucleus on there. Um, they're actually pretty big, and when they get out of circulation, out of your bloodstream, then they can be converted into macrophages, which are phagocytotic cells that will kind of just wander. Some are fixed, they stay in one area, and some just wander in different places. Um, dendritic cells are really just macrophages, um, or, um, or monocytes or macrophages that derive from the same cells, but your textbook, unlike our anatomy and physiology textbook, um, doesn't separate the two, whereas in A&P they just consider them one and the same. But dendritic cells are basically the same thing as macrophages or monocytes. And then we have our last formed element, our last um, uh, granulocyte, we have eosinophils, and eosinophils, unlike neutrophils, instead of having a trilobed nucleus, they have a bilobed nucleus. And then we have our lymphocytes here. Lymphocytes, unlike the monocytes, are still agranulocytes. Notice that those little granules or little things are inside of there, but they're not in here. Um, lymphocytes are like monocytes in that they're agranular. Um, however, unlike monocytes, their nucleus is more descriptive shaped. It's mostly round, and it kind of takes up the entire cell itself. So um, the nucleus can take up majority, like 90% of the cell, like almost all of what you see is nucleus. Now, for lymphocytes, they have more of a role in your specific or adaptive immunity because they can differentiate into T cells and they can differentiate into B cells. So we won't talk a whole lot about lymphocytes this chapter. We'll spend more time talking about them in chapter 17. So here is an example of phagocytic phagocytotic activity happening where we have a macrophage that is using these dendritic extensions to grab out a hold of this rod-shaped bacteria or this bacillus and it will pull it into the cell and break it down with its lysosomes and thus kill it. Any of these macrophages are going to treat every bacteria they encounter the exact same way. They're not going to be um, specific or there's no specificity for one or preference of one bacteria over another. Any bacteria or anything that's tagged as a, a pathogen, the toll-like receptors in the cells have induced the cytokines to say, hey, we've got some foreign invaders here. As long as that happens, then these bacteria will be consumed by this macrophage in pretty much the exact same way, which is a little bit different than what we'll see in adaptive immunity. So cells that we've looked at that are capable of undergoing phagocytosis are macrophages, which we've talked about because we saw that on this slide, that's macrophage, but also neutrophils. So neutrophils can also undergo phagocytotic activity, basically meaning that they en engulf a cell or engulf a bacteria and then break it down with its lysosomes. And lysosome is just a structure within the cell that has uh, hydrolytic enzymes that are meant for intercellular digestion. So phases of phagocytosis we have here. Um, we have that toll-like receptor that we talked about in one of our very first slides, recognizes that, hey, this is not supposed to be in the body. So as a result, we know we need to get rid of it. We don't care what kind of pathogen it is, if it's a virus, if it's um, an E. coli, if it's salmonella, whatever it is, we're going to treat it all the same. Um, or at least attempt to treat it all the same, and sometimes phagocytotic cells, depending on some of the structures of the bacteria, whether they have a capsule around them or whether or not they are gram negative, they don't easily phagocytize, but the cell macrophage will try to phagocytize it. So it says, hey, it's not supposed to be here. Um, and then we have the adherence of the phagocyte to the microbe, the ingestion of the phagocyte, and then you have what's called a phagocytic vessel that's formed here. Um, keep in mind also that this would be an excellent short answer question, the phases of phagocytosis. So this phagocytotic vessel is going to fuse with the lysosome, and after it fuses with that lysosome, we have intercellular digestion, and then you're left with these fragments or residual bodies of the bacteria that was broken down in what we call now the phagolysosome, because we had the phagosome where the phagocytotic vessel encased the pathogen, and then it fused with a lysosome, so that's why we call it a phagolysosome. It has a new name now. So those residual bodies that were in those phagolysosomes are now going to be discharged as waste materials. Another way that we can deal 
with um, microbes in, in, in your innate immunity is through what we call oxidative burst. The bacterium attaches to the neutrophil, and when it attaches to the neutrophil, it triggers the pentose phosphate pathway, which we talked about in the metabolism chapter. And after that pathway has been established, we have this electron carrier, NADPH, is going to be produced. So as that NADPH is produced, and then it will um, oxidize this oxygen and make hydrogen peroxide. So the NADPH uses the electrons um, to produce superoxide. The superoxide is going to be converted into hydrogen peroxide and water, and it's the hydrogen peroxide that actually will kill the bacteria. So even though we know neutrophils can undergo um, phagocytosis, this is another way that neutrophils can um, uh, kill bacteria is through what we call this oxidative burst, which in a nutshell is the cell making hydrogen peroxide, which we know that most bacteria are um, very sensitive to, they're very susceptible to. But as I said before, with the phagocytosis, not all bacteria are going to respond to this treatment the same way, and that just depends on whether they're gram-negative, if they have a capsule, or if it's an endospore that we're dealing with. So not all of these strategies that we're discussing here in innate immunity are going to be 100% effective. We know that because sometimes you do actually get sick, even though you have physical barriers and you have chemical factors that um, are meant to elicit an immune response, and then you have these cells um, that will phagocytize things or will cause hydrogen peroxide to be produced to kill an organism, they're not always 100% effective. So I just wanted to put that out there so that you all are kind of um, recognizing that even though, yes, in theory, this is how it's supposed to work, depending on some of the factors of the bacteria, it may not work as efficiently as we would like. And speaking of which, here are some mechanisms by which bacteria can evade phagocytosis. So I think this chart is so important that I'm going to put a star on this slide because you're definitely going to see this information again, especially in your exam. So some bacteria can inhibit the adherence process. So I'm just going to go back real quick so you can see what we're talking about here. Remember when we said we had adherence of the phagocyte to the microbe? There are some bacteria that will actually prevent that from happening because they have this M protein that's associated with it and it doesn't allow for it to adhere, adhere, adhere properly to the phagocytotic cell. Or they might have a capsule. Capsules make the bacteria very slippery. Examples of those organisms that are able to evade phagocytosis with uh, M protein or capsule or inhibit adherence are Streptococcus pyrogens, which is known to cause fevers, and streptococcus pneumoniae. Some are able to kill the phagocyte with leukocytins. So Staph aureus actually, and we'll talk about um, specifically how these organisms do this in the next upcoming chapters, in fact, uh, I believe chapter 21. So we'll start to talk about uh, microbial diseases of various organ systems. Staph, or Staph aureus will actually kill the phagocyte. Um, some can lyse the phagocyte and create membrane attack complexes so that the phagocyte, the cell that we want to kill the other cell, gets holes poked in it and then it bursts. It has osmotic lysis. Listeria monocytogens, which is a common bacteria that's found in lunch meat um, and sometimes in hot dogs. Um, for most people, if they have an infection of listeria, um, it doesn't manifest itself more than just a cold, if you will, but it is more problematic for pregnant women if they do develop listeria. So that's why they tell pregnant women, if you're going to have deli meat, make sure that you warm them up first so that you can kill this bacteria. Remember that phagosome that we had? That once the bacteria adhered to the phagocytotic cell and it was brought inside the cell and it had a phagosome there, and then it would fuse the lysosome. Well, things like Shigella, Shigella and Rickettsia. Um, Shigella causes dysentery or diarrhea. Um, different Rickettsias cause different diseases. For example, Rocky Mountain. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is caused by a resetia organism. They'll just escape the phagosome. So if they're not in the phagosome and the lysosome attaches to it, there is no intracellular digestion that takes place. 
Um, we have some that will prevent the phagosome lysosome fusion. HIV, which you're very familiar with, um, mycobacterium, which causes tuberculosis. So they can actually escape the phagosome lysosome fusion. And then we have some, like Coxelia, and this is an organism that we talked about in one of our um, case studies, our very early case study. So if you will go back to our case study from, I believe it was chapter three, um, and we talked about the life cycle of Coxiella. Um, so we've talked about this organism before, and that it has two different um, cell variants, the large and the small cell variant on there. Well. They can actually survive the phagosome mycosome complex, so intercellular digestion doesn't even work for them. So I'm going to start this slide again just to remind you all that these methods of evading phagocytosis are important enough to remember for an upcoming exam. Inflammation is also part of your innate immunity. Um, inflammation, um, you're probably very familiar with it. It's that um, signal signs of inflammation are typically redness, swelling, heat, pain, um, but and it, it makes you uncomfortable. But inflammation does have a role that it plays, and that it actually kind of sounds the alarm, if you will. Excuse me. So inflammation can activate um, acute phase proteins, things like complement, which we will talk about um, later on, um, cytokines, more chemical messengers, and kinins. Um, it can also trigger vasodilation to take place so that the blood vessels get wider, so that histamines that are produced by basophils and other types of cells um, can be released more, prostaglandins, leukotearines, any of these chemicals that will help to um, enhance an immune response will be um, able to travel to the site of the injury or the infection very quickly with this vasodilation. So different chemicals, and another star on this slide, to make sure you know this information. Chemicals that are released by damaged cells to say, hey, there's a problem over here, I need some help, are things like histamine, and histamine will allow for vasodilation to, to take place, and also the increased permeability of blood vessels so that we can get more things into the bloodstream to help fight the infection. Those wandering macrophages, we can get to the area, neutrophils, we can get to the area. Kinins also cause vasodilation and increased permeability of the blood vessels. They kind of work the same way um, as histamines. Prostaglandins are going to intensify the histamine and kinin effect, and leukotearings are going to increase the permeability of blood vessels and also increase phagocytotic attachment. As we said before, although these are strategies and methods that are employed by your innate immunity to deal with an infection, it doesn't mean that they always work for every bacteria or every pathogen or every virus that we encounter every time. It just depends on some of the structures of the bacteria. And we'll see that um, illustrated when we get to about chapter 21. So fevers, um, and we talked about streptococcus pyrogens as being um, a, a prime culprit in fevers here. It's an abnormally high body temperature. Yes, it is uncomfortable, but the purpose of a fever is to try to denature some of the proteins of the bacteria or the pathogens that are making you sick. So your hypothalamus, or these part of your brain that sets the body temperature is usually at 37 degrees Celsius. There are pyrogens or endotoxins that can be released by gram-negative cells that will cause the phagocytes to release interleukin-1. Starring, that's important, remember interleukin-1. So that when that is released, the hypothalamus will release prostaglandins or more chemical messengers that will reset the body to a higher temperature. And in a nutshell, because this interleukin-1 has been released by this phagocytotic cell because of the presence of these endotoxins from these gram-negative bacteria that are now invading our body, it says to the brain, hey, we need to raise the temperature because if we can raise the temperature a little bit, then we can denature the proteins of this bacteria and maybe cause it to die. Now, the drawback of that is that if the temperature is too high for too long, not only is it going to denature the bacteria's proteins, it's also going to denature your protein. So that's why it's important to keep an eye on fever. And if your proteins become denatured, then that means that they lose their form. 
And, and the same thing with bacteria. If a protein loses its form, it loses its function. So in order to facilitate this fever and to increase this body temperature, we have an increase in the rate of metabolism. And we do have this shivering which occurs. And shivering is just your muscles that are rubbing against one another. So if you take your hands and then put them together and then act as if you're warming them up and rub them very quickly against one another, you're generating heat. So imagine your muscles doing the same thing on the inside of your body. So it's just a way to generate heat. Then you also have vasodilation um, and sweating that takes place as your body temperature starts to fall when we have um, the opposite end of this. And then our last little bit that we're going to talk about here is the complement system. The complement system is a cascade of enzymatic activities that happens with proteins that are activated to result in three outcomes. The three outcomes of, of, of complement activation, starring, important, are going to be optimization, which will coat a bacteria to make it sticky so that if it had a capsule and it couldn't, we couldn't attach to it or couldn't adhere to it, like we saw for Streptococcus pyrogens or Streptococcus pneumoniae, with optimization, we can have some of these proteins, these complement proteins, attached to it and make it stickier and easier for phagocytosis to take place. Another outcome of, of complement is inflammation. Inflammation, once again, is basically sounding the alarm, so it increases um, the permeability and the diameter of blood vessels and the attraction of phagocytes to the area of injury or infection. And then they also have cytolysis. Cytolysis is bursting of the microbes due to the inflow of water or extracellular material because we have these macular adhesion complexes or MAC complexes that have been formed. Or basically, we just poke holes in the bacteria in order for cytolysis to take place. So from this slide, things that I want you to remember is that complement is just a series of enzymatic activities where proteins are activated to result in three outcomes. Optimization, know what that is, enhances phagocytotic activity. Inflammation, more ringing of the alarm, increasing permeability of the blood vessels and attracting phagocytotic cells to the area, and cytolysis, poking holes in the bacteria in order for it to burst. So here's just a close-up picture of that inflammation uh, stimulated by a complement protein. You have these different complement proteins that will attach to a histamine-releasing cell, such as a basophil or a mast cell. And when that happens, histamine is released. Um, and then when that histamine is released, it's going to attract these phagocytes. So we have this C5A complement protein, which is going to chemically call for macrophages and neutrophils to come to this area, this is the site of injury or infection. So there are a couple of different ways that we can activate complement. So far, we just talked about what complement is, a series of enzymatic activities that will activate these proteins that result in optimization, cytolysis, and inflammation. Now we're going to talk about what activates it or what turns it on. First way that activates is what we call the classical pathway. That's where the microbe is just in the body. And then antibodies that are made from the plasma cells of your B cells attach to the antigens, which are the yellow things, on the microorganism. The C1 protein then attaches to this antigen, antibody, antigen, antibody complex. As a result, the activated C1 protein splits into C2 and C2A. And then we have it split into C2B and C2A, and then we have a C4, which splits into C4A and C4B and so forth, where we still get our three outcomes that happen. Big things I want you to remember here is that activation of the classical pathway begins with a microorganism's antigen binding to antibodies and then starting with the um, C1 protein. Another method of activating complement we call the alternate method, they didn't get very creative here, the alternate method of uh, uh, complement protein where we have our microbe and it has these different factors on it, these lipid carbohydrate complexes called BP, B, 
D and P factors on here. Instead of the C1 protein recognizing the antigen antibody complex, it is the C3 protein that recognizes these three factors, and it causes the C3 protein to enzymatically or chemically split into C3B and C3A, which still gives us our three outcomes of complement, um, inflammation, cytolysis, and optimization. The alternate pathway of complement activation is actually a faster pathway than the classical pathway. And then our final pathway, there are three ways to activate complement, three outcomes of complement, three ways of activating it, is the lictin pathway. So with the lictin pathway, a carbohydrate containing mannose um, is on the surface or the antigen of the bacteria, and that lictin binds to the invading cell, and that bound lictin is going to split C2 into C2B and C2A, and also C4 into C4. C4B and C4A, which combine to activate C3, which gives us our three outcomes. So the fastest way to activate complement is the alternate method. Second fastest pathway, I guess they're about the same, are the lysine pathway and then the classical pathway. For the classical pathway, the complement proteins recognize the antigen antibody complex. With the um, alternate pathway, the P, D, and B factors are recognized and it activates the C3 protein. And with the lysine pathway, we have the C2 and the C4 protein that are activated because of the lysine binding to the invading cell. And as we saw with um, uh, phagocytosis, some bacteria can evade complement. Some capsules prevent the complement activation, whether it's complement or a classical alternative or the lectin process. Some serpent lipid carbohydrate complexes, because they have those, actually prevent the MHC, the holes be, being poked in it. And some bacteria can actually enzymatically digest the C5A protein, and it keeps the process. So I'm going to go back to this slide. So if the C5A protein right here isn't activated, then it can keep this whole process of histamine being released from taking place. So um, there are some various strategies that different bacteria can um, use to evade complements. Two, um, three different types of interferons I want you to remember, alpha and beta, which cause um, the cell to produce antiviral proteins that inhibit viral replication within the cell, and then the gamma interferon causes neutrophils and macrophages to enhance their phagocytotic activity. And then finally, um, we have transferrin as part of your innate immunity, which will, will bind up the iron that's in the blood so that microorganisms don't have that trace element of iron to use in their metabolism, which can thus um, prevent their metabolisms from happening properly. And then we have antimicrobial peptides or protein fragments that will can lyse bacterial cells. All right, so that is all of Chapter 16. The next time we meet again, we'll talk about Chapter 17, um, Adaptive Immunity. So have a great morning, noon, or night.